we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 6, chapter 12, and Jude 3 and 4. If you don't have your Bible, but you do have your commentary, we are on lesson number 5 of the winter quarter. We're on page 193. Today's lesson is titled, Dead, Yielded, and Free. Now remember when we ended last week, we ended with Paul's teaching how we walk in righteousness. We can walk in the uprightness and walk in the life of Christ. So we ended last week with walking in the life of Christ. We're going to start this week on being dead with Christ. That sounds a little bit ironic, does it not, Sharon? But let's listen in verse number 5. This is Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now when they're talking about death here, we spiritually speak of death being that of a sinful life. That old man that we kill off, or died with Christ. That old man, that is that sinful old man. That's where we came from. Not where we're going to. That's where we came from. So the old man is now dead. Your sins died with Christ on the cross. Okay? Your sins died there. Now, can they stay there? Yes. If you do what? If you let them. How are we going to let them? What do we need to do? I'm going to give you a hint. Starts with a B. Rhymes with leave. Come on, put that together, people. Are we asleep this morning? If we believe on Christ, we believe that He died for our sins. We believe that He was resurrected. We have to believe in Jesus, knowing that He is the Christ. It says in verse 7, For he that is dead is freed. From sin. In verses 8 through 11, it says, Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have a promise of eternity. We have an eternal hope, and that eternal hope came through one man, and who is that? That is through Jesus Christ. It is through his death, it is through his life, that we have eternal life. <clears throat> if we go on over into verses 12 through 14. And I'm going to give you one of these little side notes here on page 198. It says simply, only as we accept our responsibility and appropriate God's provisions, will we make any progress in our pursuit of holiness? We need to accept the life that God has blessed us with and know that He has a reason that He gave us that particular life. I'm here for a reason. I am a school teacher for a reason. It isn't by happen chance. It isn't by, oh, coincidence. No, it is because God made me where I am. He is the one who brought me to this point. He is the one who has the work for me to do. And why am I going to do this work? Because I love him. Why do we do anything for somebody? Because we love them. In verses number 12 through 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. As those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Number 14 there. Let's read that first little half together. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Let's read it one more time. For sin shall not have dominion over you. What kind of a promise does that give you? What's that tell you, Shelby? That's exactly right. If you stand up and say no to sin, it can't force you, can it? It absolutely can't force you. These people that say, it was a moment of weakness. I just couldn't help myself. Oh, yeah, you can. Right there it says you can. In verse number 14, Romans chapter 6. For sin shall not have dominion over you. In back in Genesis, it is written that God gave mankind dominion over what? All things. All living things. We have dominion over, right? And here it is in the New Testament that sin shall not have dominion. So apparently we have dominion over sin as well. So tell me, why is it that so many people will choose to live sinfully when it only has the power and control they give it? Tell me that again. Yeah, because of the flesh. Totally. Absolutely. If it feels good, do it, right? How much do we see out in society that promotes that very thing? Oh, and here's one of my favorites that Christians use too. It's okay if I do this at my own house because it's not going to damage my testimony. Some of them, they'll watch ungodliness. They'll do everything else. And I have been guilty of the same stuff. And if y'all are, are perfect, then maybe I'm just needing this for myself. But we'll allow something to go on behind the scenes that nobody sees or knows about us. Because we say, well, that's not going to damage my testimony. Uh, who, who's your testimony for? Is it not for God? Is God not everywhere? Is he omnipotent and omniscient? Doesn't he know it all? He's everywhere. He knows everything. He sees it all happening. So who do we think we're hiding sinful nature from? Absolutely nobody. And a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of Christians, so-called Christians, they will come out and they'll say stuff like that. Well, it won't damage my testimony. Right here it tells me plainly, sin shall not have dominion over me. That tells me what can I do as a Christian? What can I do? I can rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Now, is that going to immediately stop everything? No. Nah. What's the devil going to do? He's going to amp it up about ten powerful times more, is he not? He's going to hit you in the most... The weakest part. Okay? Where he finds that he can really come in against your armor, that's where he's going to come in. For example, a lot of these movies are out, these um, the Lord of the Rings, stuff like that. And they show these great armies and they're battling and all like that. And so these bad guys, when they come in and the good guys have their little arrows going to fly, where do you think they shoot the arrow at? Right in the center of the chest. They're going to shoot it where there's no protection. The devil works the same way. He is going to shoot those fiery darts where you have the least amount of protection. Uh, I heard on one movie they said uh, the weakest point is at the neck. All right. Then if that's where your weakest point is, that's where the devil is going to try to attack. Maybe. And you know where the weakest point is for a lot of Christians? heart. That's where we seem to have everything in life rotate around that heart. Do we not? Or where? Or the brain? <coughs> we think about it and we justify it instead of, well, it, it felt like the right thing to do. The heart will start out and then we'll start thinking. God love us for thinking too much. 
Sometimes we need to quit the thinking. Boy, isn't that a scary statement to make? Sometimes we need to let God control the thinking. That's a little bit better, isn't it? Stop the stupid. That's right. <laughs> That's a <clears throat> saying that I love. We have some stinking thinking, don't we, sometimes? We have to understand that, you know what? When it comes down to making those decisions, where do we need to turn first and foremost? To God. Where can we receive that instruction? A lot of people say, well, I've prayed and God's not telling me anything. Where can you look to read what He's already sent to you? Where is that? Tell me that again back there, Daddy. In the Bible. Because last Sunday we said the Bible is what? Truth. That's where our main truth is going to come from. We need to realize when we need help, even the small things, just look to the Bible. Even if it's the smallest, I was about to say the smallest sin out there, but really sin's kind of equal, is it not? Sin is sin is sin. But we as humans, we, we label sin, don't we? We label a small sin to a big sin and all the different sins in between. When really the Bible teaches that sin, it's sin. There is no big, there is no little. It's just sin. And it needs to be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But that hope right there, that helps me a lot. Romans 6 and 14. For sin shall not have dominion. Over me. I have been in situations sometimes where I felt like I had absolutely no control. You ever been there? You feel like, oh my goodness, I can't get out of this. I'm going to have to go along with everything. No, you don't. You can stand up for Christ. Will it be easy? No. <laughs> but does it get easier as you start doing that? Absolutely. Preacher. <laughs> they say... That the walk, walking dead, pretty much. Well, Paul teaches, we pretty much are all walking dead, are we not? We were born to die, and in spiritual sense, are we not all the walking dead? <laughs> So we need to become dead to what? We need to become dead to sin and to the world and realize who is on your throne. I forget who it was that preached the sermon. It was either you or Jimmy or Charlie, one of the three. It may even be Uncle Junior. It's been a long time. Who is on your throne? If you sit on your own throne, then guess who you're serving? Yourself. If you have your children sitting on the throne, guess who you serve? Your children. If you have your job sitting on the throne, your means of existence, your reason for being alive rotates around that job. And that is possible. Now understand, there is a difference there though. A lot of people will mistake that. They'll take it wrong. They think that when we say if your job's on your throne, they'll pop up and say, well, you got to work. We understand you have to work. We're talking about where is your passion? What do you really live to do every day? Do we really live to serve God every day? Or do we live to serve a certain football team we want to follow on TV? This uh, past Friday, Tennessee people make me laugh. They tickle me to death. They are so diehard. They, their blood runs orange. It does. They had this, um, what's it called, Tax Slayer Bowl football game on Friday night. Tennessee was playing uh, against Iowa. See, I kept up with it a little bit. And it was taking place in Florida. Was it Tampa Bay? Something like that. Okay. <clears throat> well, they're going down in Florida going to play this game. Well, my boss's daughter went down there. She's a student at UT. And she went down there for the game. And she sent back pictures. All you saw was a sea of orange. She said, well, it might have been in Florida, but they've got some orange wear today. And I started thinking about that. How many of us dress for Christ? 
How many of us show up for the pep rally? You know that's what church is. It's pep rallies for Christ. That's why I guess the doggone loud. That's why I proclaim that I'm a cheerleader for Jesus. If I'm going to get out here, I've seen myself at basketball games. Being a basketball coach, you know that you holler a lot. Can I get an amen right here? It is. Sometimes we get a little bit heated. Maybe not all of us, but a lot of us get heated when we coach basketball games. I'm going to have to point you out on this a lot, okay? So, if we're going to get in there and we're going to get so heated and get emotional and get passionate about our team and our that game and, and all this kind of stuff, then if we aren't just as passionate about Christ, are we saying the team is more important? See, I want Christ. I want Christ to be the most important. If I'm not willing to act like, for lack of better words, a goonie head, if I'm not willing to come and act like that for Christ to cheer Him on, why should I be out here in the world acting like that to cheer something else on? But we'll get out here and we'll just act a fool, won't we? <clears throat> we'll hoop and we'll holler. The same way that I holler on the outside, I'm going to holler like that on the inside. Because I want to be a cheerleader for Christ. Just as well as cheering on my ball players, I want to cheer on God. And we need to do that. And we have the power to do that, do we not? <laughs> if you'll go with me over to, now we're going to go to chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And this is one that just about kills me every time I read it. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Yeah. The one right before it starts with, Lord, I am no longer my own. All right. A little side note before that one. Lord, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low. By you. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. Now, how many of y'all have driven a vehicle sometime in your life? You've got out there and you've driven sometime in your life. When you see a yield sign, what do you have to do? What's that mean? Yet you have to hold your car back, right? Yield means to hold back. As a Christian, when sin enters in, what does it mean? Yield. Hold yourself back from the sin. Hold yourself back and wait for God. What's the Bible teach me over in Isaiah, Uncle Junior? If I wait upon the Lord, what's He going to do? Anybody? Oh, like wings of eat, He will renew our strength. I don't know about you. I'd kind of like to have me an eagle wing every once in a while. You talk about being able to raise you up, live above all this stuff coming and going. We need to yield ourselves. That means stop yourself and live for what Christ intended you to live for. For what God created you for. Hold yourself back. Paul teaches that he did what daily? He died daily. He had to put off what? The old man. Because through Christ, we're made how? We're made new. Before Christ, we were the old man. After Christ, we're the new creation. I don't know about you. I don't have to be new. That's a little poem for you. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and will of God so my body it's not my own who does my body belong to it belongs to God 
if we don't take care of our bodies? Couple of questions. One, does God have the ability to come in and heal? Totally. Complete healing, does he not? <coughs> Two, does he have the choice? <laughs> well, yeah. If you're going to choose to live in sin and constantly be damaging your body, does he have to come and heal? Absolutely not. We've told Leah from little girl all the way up, we'll get you the first one, but if you don't take care of it, Forget it. We're not going to buy you something else when you don't take care of this one. Right now, we're having a struggle with her. She doesn't care for her bedroom. Period. She prefers my bedroom. And has made herself her own bed in my bedroom at the foot of my bed. My child is 13 years old. I can't get her out of my bedroom. I understand when she's two. <laughs> Now, I'm a little concerned. Good young room. Oh, but mama, I like it so much better in here. It sleeps so much better in here. <laughs> so she looks at me and she goes, you know what? I'd love to have one of those beds that, that does this or has like a, a desk in it and da da da. I'm like, why? <laughs> it's not like you use the one that we've got for yet. Well, do you think that we're going to go put money into a thing that she's not even going to take care of or use? Absolutely not. Where do we get our mindset from? Whose image are we made in? We're made in God's image. And being made in God's image, don't you know that some of that same mindset that we have as parents comes from God? So understand. If you don't take care of the body that God has given you, do you think he's just going to come back over and over and over and over? Now, I know that we're real quick to jump on the bandwagon of, of simpler things. Of, well, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. Oh, you shouldn't be drinking. Oh, you shouldn't be smoking. You know, it, it does break down even simpler than that. Should we constantly take in nothing but... Caffeinated drinks all day long. We don't hear that those are really bad, now do we? Hell, some people will say, oh, that sugar content. Well, Diet Coke has caffeine in it, just like a regular one does. And if you continue to drink, even on the diet side of it, can it end up damaging you in some way? Yes, it can. If it goes against your body... The word says to do everything in what? It's over in Timothy. Moderation. Do it with moderation. I shouldn't live off of a diet of nothing more than chocolate chip cookies and Mountain Dews. Well, that would be a good diet, wouldn't it? I'd like that one myself. But, <laughs> Keeblers, you know, the chewy ones. <laughs> Soft bass, that's it. <clears throat> That'd be my favorite. I could even try to justify it saying that I love to eat those while drinking milk. You know, even a diet of just pure milk is not healthy either because of the calcium intake. Because cal too much calcium, that can cause, well, it can cause additional growths on your teeth. It can cause gallstones. It can cause kidney stones. It can cause stuff that you see everything needs to be moderation, does it not? Now, where can we look? We can look into the Word of God. We can look at everything that God has made for us and understand how to use it correctly. All the things that mankind has come in to do, to dump the things and all like that, sometimes it's not always for the best. But what do we need to do? We need to read. We need to study up on it. We need to know what we're putting into our bodies. Even before I take a vitamin, I read up on it. I don't want just anything put into this. I want to make sure it's only what God would have me do, right? Common sense tells us, don't drink constantly. Don't eat constantly. Don't. Common sense tells us some of these things. It's not. Common sense should also tell us, oh, let's, let's go for a simple one. How about pansies? We shouldn't be. Putting extra cuts and holes and everything else in our set. I like to go in the belief that I came out how God wanted me to be. 
And if he wants it different, he'll he'll make it different. But until then, I'm going to try to let him take care of it. Now, can that be taken to the extremes? You betcha. And some people do everything in their world to justify everything. But at the same time, I'm going to lean into the Word of God. I'm going to see what the Word of God tells me to do. And I'm going to do my best to live by it. Whether the Holy Ghost convicts me of it or not, I am going to lean into the Word of God. You know, you can receive conviction for something through the Word of God that otherwise you wouldn't think about. Be not conformed to this world. Me nuts. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How can we renew our mind? Through the Word of God. Can we not? We'll see if this one's a little bit better because that one's... You don't hear this one at all? You want this one on the other? Yeah, but it's cutting in and out on me. I don't like that. There's that sh- Oh, it's, it's awful. Anyhow, understand that your bodies, and I like this one little word in here really stands out. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, what kind of service? Reasonable. It's not even an extreme service. It's not even a going beyond what the ordinary is service. It is simply a reasonable service. And you you know, it's really a simple thing. And you know something else I have found? When I do separate myself, even if something so small as what I drink at a meal, I have noticed that when I drink water, I save money. People do drugs, what's it cost a lot of? Money. One of my biggest pet peeves, and if this strikes you, I'm sorry, but one of my biggest pet peeves are individuals who will come asking, begging, oh, we need this, we've got a light bill, we've got a phone bill, we've got a food need, we've got this need, we've got that need. Yet every time I see them, they have a pack of cigarettes and they're smoking. They don't give them things away, do they? Last time I checked, those those things, even the cheap ones were what, like three bucks or something? I'll keep up with it too well. Well, that's a, that's over a gallon of gas now. You know? So, it drives me nuts when people come to the church and oh, we've got this need. We can't do this. Yet every time I see them, well, that need kind of gets met. And that's not what I really consider a need. Because when I read my word, what's the Bible teach me over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13? It says, with every temptation, what will he do? He will make a way of what? Of escape. So don't tell me that through Christ you can't stop doing something that you want to stop doing. You can stop doing stuff that you don't want to stop doing, can't you, Greg? Understand that. So that's just my personal pet peeve. And that's, I guess that's why I'm not the pastor and not going to be anytime soon. Not able to be. We need to understand that our body, it's not our body anymore. Our body belongs to Christ and we need to treat it accordingly. Something else I always hated when I was working as a cashier. They don't do it now since they got them little, they call them EBT cards. They get money deposited on them. They don't, they don't have what it used to be. Back in old school times when I was a cashier about 400 years ago, they had, they give out the little, it looked like Monopoly money is what it looked like to me. They called it food stamps, but really it looked like Monopoly money. And I always thought it was hilarious that they'd send in, they'd have three or four kids, and each child will, would take a certain food stamp and a candy bar and come up because you couldn't give change back in food stamp. I'm talking change, change. Instead, you had to give actual quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies. And then I'd watch as the kid would report back to the parent, give them the change where they could come in and buy things like beer and cigarettes, stuff like that. And I'm thinking, yep, that's my tax dollars hard at work right there. So I thank God that they did change it over to this EBT card thing. Hopefully it can monitor it more. 
Or they come through and they're barely feeding their children, but those five hound dogs that they got outside that does absolutely nothing for them and they buy 50 pound bags of dog food, usually Alpo or something high dollar. You know, I found out I can go to the dollar store and buy that stuff a lot cheaper. But they'll come in and they'll give cash hand over fist for, for the dog food and cat food when their kids can't get a bite ahead. I don't know. Maybe some of these things don't bother some people, but they really run all over me. We want to help everybody coming and going, yet some people won't help themselves. There is a difference between a hand up and a hand out. Do you know what I'm talking about? There are some people, you don't mind helping them when you know that they're trying to do better. You're doing your best, and they're trying to stop certain things. Don't mind helping those people. But when they come back and the only time you see them for two weeks straight, you know the third week they're going to ask for money. And that happens right here in this church just like everywhere else. There is more than one family that we know when they start attending regular, week number three, they're going to be sitting waiting after church to ask for a handout. Are you kidding me? Why be like that? If you will serve God and put God first in all things, last time I checked, He's never failed me. Last time I checked, He never let me go hungry. And if I ever did go hungry, it's only because I thought I was hungry. Do you understand the difference on that one? He might be trying to get your attention. In that little side note where it says, if He brings me low, so be it. You know, God sometimes has to bring us low to get us to look up. If we're so high and mighty that we're always looking down, sometimes He's going to have to knock our feet out from under us, put us flat of our backs, so all we can do is sit and look up for a while. So we can get refocused on who God is and realize who is in control of our lives and realize who needs to be on the throne of our lives. It doesn't need to be a person A place, a thing, a habit. It needs to be God. Because sin has no dominion over us. And then (laughs) we go back to Romans chapter 6. And there was one last week from Romans chapter 6, the first verse where it says, uh, should we sin so that grace may abound? And what was those next two words? God forbid. Oh, look, in verse number 15. Get ready now. Y'all are going to have to get active here. Verse 15 says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And the church said, God forbid. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That right there tells me you've heard the saying, you don't straddle the fence, you're either hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, they spew you out. Right there it is. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Pick one. You're either sinning and dying or you're going to obey and be righteous. It's that simple. There is no, well, I'm going to obey this week and then next week I'm going to live in sin. And then I'm going to come back and and get saved again. And then I'm going to... God hates backsliding. Verse number 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, that ye have obeyed from the heart That form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from Righteousness. Either you're going to be free of righteousness or you're going to be free of sin. There is no both of them. I'm either walking on for God or I'm walking backwards away from God. I'm always moving one way or the other. Even if you think you're standing still, you're still moving. My kids... 
in science class, I'll start teaching them how the earth is always spinning. <coughs> and they're like, well, we don't feel like we're moving. You're always moving. The earth is always spinning. I can't tell you the exact speed, but you're always spinning. It's always in a rotation as it moves. So not only are we constantly doing this, but we're constantly doing this too. Try that. Now, that'll put you on your butt in a heartbeat. Anyway, and my kids, they don't, they don't get that concept. It's hard for them sometimes. Because to them, I don't feel like I'm moving. You know, spiritually speaking, sometimes we don't feel like we're moving. We don't feel like that we're backsliding. We don't feel like that we're getting cold. But let me tell you, if you're not doing something to try to get hot and hot and hot, guess what you're going to do? You're going to get cold and cold and cold. When's the last time that you cooked a big old pot of soup? This past week, oh, all those uh, wives tell us what they tell you to do. How many people had some good old hog jaw, black eyed peens, beans, peas, something? It's peens in my world. Black eyed peas, um, cabbage, isn't that, isn't that what the old traditions say? Collard greens, whoo! Mm, that's some good. Cornbread, soft up them black eyed peas. Anyway. When I cooked the black eyed peas, yes, I actually did. When I cooked the black eyed peas, by the way, I don't eat them. I think they taste like dirt, but my husband seems to love them for some reason. Anyhow, <laughs> I've tried people for years. He's, he's one of those that's like, you need to eat at least a spoonful. I'm like, are you kidding? Let me go out in the front yard and start rooting. <laughs> it's the same taste to me. But anyway, I won't go there <laughs> because I double up on my hog jaw. Anyway, <laughs> that's some good stuff right there. Especially if you burn it just a touch around the edges where it's really crispy. Mm, that's, mm, that's good eating right there. Anyhow. If you cook them black eyed peas, you make a great big old pot of them, you put them on the stove, oh, they boiling hot. Boiling! You've thrown in just a touch of extra seasoning. Just, mmm, you could, you smell them and your mouth's watering. You know it's gonna be just delicious. What happens if you cut off the stove? Are they immediately cold? They still gonna be hot! You still gonna have to wait so you don't scald your mouth out because you don't wanna miss out on that taste. Okay, so I leave them sitting there. What's going to happen? The longer they sit, now have they moved? Did they change? They didn't go nowhere but in the pot, right? But the longer they sit still, the colder they get. Same thing in a Christian lifestyle. The longer you sit still, the colder you're going to get. And you know what? You can get cold while sitting in church. And I'm not talking about physically neither. I know most of y'all think we're freezing you to death. I'm up here sweating. Like always, chunky, hormonal female. Sorry. But anyway, <laughs> understand you've got to do something to keep on keeping on. Even when you're out sick. I'm going to go over here to Mr. John Coley Huggins. <laughs> Jim loves to holler that whole name out. Is there a junior or something in there too? Anyway. <laughs> Tell me, Uncle Junior. You've been battling sickness lately. And you haven't been able to come to church as much as you want to. Can you feel the spiritual weakness growing even while you're sitting home sick? I don't think you're sitting at home in sin. I think even while you were at home you were probably watching your preachers on TV. You probably read your Bible every day, probably more than once a day. Constantly in prayer. But at the same time, when you're sitting at the house, and you're never fellowshipping, and you're never out being busy on behalf of God, does it not make you feel like you're getting spiritually weak? I have sat in church before, thinking, my God, what am I doing here? Why am I listening to this? It's starving me to death. Have you ever felt like that before? It can happen. And then when you finally go to church and you get some of that spiritual food thrown on you, I can't help it every time. It's, it's like the poor Jews in the concentration camps when they were first <laughs> rescued and they started to give them food. 
some of them would literally eat until they died because they just could not get enough of it because they had done without for so long. Have you ever felt like that? And all I could think was, whew, when does church start again? I've got to get some more of that. That was some good stuff. I need some more of that. Well, that's how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to want that word. And let me tell you, if you're not doing something to stay warm and try to get hot, you're going to slip cold. Once again, what then shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace. And the church said, God forbid. When we were servants of sin, we were free from righteousness. That means no righteousness clung to us. Which tells me, if I'm a servant of righteousness, guess what else can't hold to me? Sin. Verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is dead. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through whom Jesus Christ our Lord. We have everlasting hope through Jesus Christ. We need to live according to the word of God. We need to believe in Jesus that he not only came and lived but died and rose again to cover our sins. I couldn't pay my debt. I dare say you couldn't pay yours either. Only Christ could pay my debt. Our golden text is Romans 6.11 Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.11 One day at a time this week, go out there and purpose yourself not to sin in any way. Now, you might say, well, that's easy. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to sin. I never cuss. I never watch anything bad. Okay, I can understand that. Do you know better than to constantly spew out negativity? Jimmy proclaimed today is a non-griping day, right? No complaining, no griping. If the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, Oh, God, I can't believe that, da, 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 and it's all negative, that's a sin too. If you talk about anyone in a negative way, in Ephesians 4.29, it says plainly, how are we supposed to talk about the brother or sister? There's a little word there called edifying. What does edifying mean? You need to build them up. You need to say something good about them. You know those little t-shirts they used to have, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all? That's, that's a biblical thing for me. If you don't have something good to say, just shut up. Nobody wants to hear it. Seriously. Do something to put God first. Be strong enough to put God first. And let me tell you something. Just because friends invite you to do stuff, that don't mean you have to do it either, does it? Mom? Oh, yeah, I saw that and I liked that too. On the bottom of page 203, sin. S stands for serpent who brought sin into the world. I is for my sinful human nature. I am my own worst enemy. N stands for nothing. Because if you live in sin, you're going to feel empty. You're going to feel like you have nothing on the inside. That's why so many people think, oh, if I had money, I'd have everything, and they'll get into all this stuff. That's right. No. The only thing that's going to fill you up and give you joy is going to be Jesus. We get out here and we try, oh, this past week, one of the biggest party days of the year. What day was it? New Year's. New Year's Eve. <laughs> Lots of people. Oh, I'm going over so-and-so's. Oh, my friend had me over here. Oh, I'm going to go do this. You know how they end up the next day? Not feeling as good as I felt. They're hung over. They're hung up. They're hanging on. They're doing anything they can to get over it. I don't have to get over Jesus. With Jesus filling up my life, I don't have to worry about anybody else. And you know what it takes? 
All I have to do is yield myself. What does it mean to yield yourself? Just hold back. And if people who try to get you involved in certain things, if they don't understand when you say, I just can't participate in that, then what kind of people are you around? You know what it says there when you're supposed to separate yourself from sin? Sometimes you won't be able to hang around those people either. It's a sad situation. I have been there before. And I'm going to bet every one of you have been there before. But what's it give me that promise over there in Romans? Wasn't that verse 14? Where it says that sin has what? <laughs> no dominion over me. None. We, need, we might need to go back and read that again. I think that was my favorite one in this, in this whole thing. One of y'all have a favorite one? Yep, right there it is. Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For sin shall, what was that word? Not have dominion over you. Sin only has dominion on what you give it. On what you allow it. Is it always easy? No. Will it get easier? Yes. Everything gets easier with practice, doesn't it? Don't forget Golden Text 6 and 11. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 